teaching to you to silence your phones. Well, I am so excited tonight, um, and especially because I've been reading Joanne Lipman's um, new book, but she is a pioneering journalist and the author of the number one bestseller. That's what she said, what men and women need to know about working together. And next, the power of reinvention in life and work. And just commercial break, pause. If you would like to buy this book, Elm Street Books is right over there. So please feel free afterwards. She has served as editor-in-chief of USA Today, USA Today Network, Condé Nast Portfolio, and the Wall Street Journal's Weekend Journal, leading these organizations to six Pulitzer Prizes. She is also on air, CN an on-air CNBC contributor and Yale University journalism lecturer. Ms. Lipsman began her career as a reporter for the Wall Street Journal, ultimately rising to deputy managing editor, the first woman to attain that post and supervising coverage that won three Pulitzer Prizes. Her work has been published in numerous outlets, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, Time, Fortune, Newsweek, and the Harvard Business Review. She is a frequent public speaker with engagements, including the World Economic um, Forum in Davos, the Aspen Ideas Festival, the Federal Reserve Board, and, and I have to let you know that I've cut out a lot of her bio. Um, and she has worked with numerous companies on issues of gender equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I am just so excited that you're here for one of our civility lecture series. And this is this series has been going ongoing since 2011 and has been co-sponsored by Hearst Media and the Dylan Schneider Group. So welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. It is a pleasure to be here. And I'm thrilled that we got here after the traffic we've experienced. <laughs> um, and I cut off my first question. There we go. So if, if you haven't started to read next yet, I, I'll just put in a quick plug um, because it's very well researched and it it reflects your career that of being a great researcher um, but it's also there's great stories in here but you say that all of us will have to go through at least one reset or reappraisal in our lives and probably more so just so we understand the terms here. What do you mean by reinventing ourselves? And what sort of crisis would compel someone into such a reset? Sure, sure. Well, thank you so much. Um, it's a great question. So for those who haven't read the book yet, so next, The Power of Reinvention in Life and Work, what it is, it's a deeply reported guide to navigating change in how we live, how we work, how we lead. It is backed by hundreds of interviews that I did, most of them during COVID in those past three years, uh, with people who have gone through very significant changes successfully, along with insights from the experts. So I spoke to psychologists, neuroscientists who study what happens in our brains when we have these aha moments. I spoke to management gurus. And the reason that I wrote the book, it literally is for this moment in time. And clearly all of us go through personally, right? You're, you're going to go through these moments in life where there's a, a major life event that leads you to need to pivot. But what happened to us three years ago was when the pandemic struck, it hit all of us all at once. And we were suddenly put in this position where we were started to rethink our priorities and rethink our, our how we did our jobs and our relationships to work. And so many people were feeling unmoored. And, and literally the inspiration for the book was, I gotta say exactly three years ago, it was early on in the pandemic, when it became very clear that this was not a transitory thing that was going to end in a few weeks. And suddenly we had no idea where it was going to end, how it was going to end, and what was the world going to look like. And I thought to myself, we need a guidebook to show us the way there. And um, I literally woke up in the middle of the night and said, I, I need to write that guidebook. And I started the reporting that day. So it was your aha moment. It was my aha moment, truly. And I have a whole chapter on aha moments and how they happen and why they happen. And now I understand where mine came from. <laughs> <laughs> but do you think your work as a journalism, um, both in print and broadcast, has influenced your thinking about the changes we make in our life and how we each of, how we reach the goals we set? 
Yeah, the, only in the sense that, you know, as a journalist, um, what we are always trying to do is, as one of my bosses once said, we're always trying to see around corners, right? We're trying to figure out sort of not just what is happening today and now, but how is that going to impact us going into the future? And that was, to me, that's always sort of the most exciting part of journalism is trying to kind of see around those corners. And that's what I was doing with Next, with that reporting was I was trying to say, I started talking to people who had gone through these major, major transformations um, because I wanted to understand sort of how did they do it successfully? What can we learn from it? And where can we take it from, from there? And you write about reinventing ourselves in life and in work. Yes. So let's start with work. In the course of your research, you interviewed hundreds of people who have transformed their careers. Can you tell us what some of the most amazing of these transformations were? Sure, sure. So I interviewed so many people. I'm going to tell you a few stories, and then I want to explain how it all fits in, because what I did was I interviewed all of these people who had all kinds of different changes. Some were careers, some were changing their life, some were coming back from failure, some were, you know, had been experienced terrible trauma. Um, and then I talked to all these experts, like the psychiatrist and the neuroscientist, and I asked them all to walk me through the process that they went through. They all used different words, but they were all describing exactly the same process. And it's what I call the reinvention roadmap, and it's four steps, which I'll walk you through in a minute. But first, just a couple of examples of, of some of the great people. I would say um, I have, they're all my favorite. They're all my favorite children, as we say. Um, but one of my very favorites is James Patterson, who I'm sure you're familiar with, the author that, you know, he is the best selling author of our day and perhaps ever. And um, I actually, he actually started out his career as an ad executive. And I first met James Patterson more than 30 years ago when I was a young Wall Street Journal reporter. I covered the advertising business. And one day I was writing about the Burger King ad campaign. Those of you who remember the Burger Wars of the 80s, I am dating myself, <laughs> but I was covering that. And um, I went to go interview the guy who ran the Burger King campaign and at J. Walter Thompson, and it was James Patterson. And at the time, I get there early one morning. I vividly remember this. I get there really early. I'm dragging my feet. And he's like, oh, well, I've been up for hours already because what I really want to be is a writer. And I'm thinking to myself, like, yeah, sure. You and everybody else, right, wants to be a writer. And he says, no, I got a book published. And he gives me this book, which I promptly put in my bag, forgot about it. I recently went back and found the Kirkus review of that book that he gave me. And I will tell you the first two words of that review were abysmally dumb. And <laughs> the last two words of that review were deserves drowning. <laughs> so he was a struggling writer. And I went back to him all these years later and, and he was very gracious with his time. And I said, just walk me through how you got from there to where you are today. And, and he did, he walked me through, but what was so cool was that the process he went through, and we may all say, oh my God, well, he's special because he's James Patterson, but it was the same process in terms of what he went through and the mentality that he went through as a guy I met who was a telephone repairman for three decades. And, you know, out of Boston, very working class guy, didn't go to college. And, and, um, but yet he had this secret desire and he, in his spare time, would draw very intricate drawings of shoes. And he ultimately became a women's shoe designer at the age of 60. Um, and he was actually named Boston Magazine's best new designer. And they called him fashion's newest rising superstar and he was 62 years old. But the cool thing is, Chris Donovan, the, sh the telephone repairman, had a very similar trajectory. And so did so many other people I talked to. I talked to a JP Morgan economist for 30 years, worked in London and Manhattan, and today is a cattle farmer in the Hudson Valley. <laughs> I spoke to a mom who, you know, she had a Harvard MBA, hard charging career, quit the workforce to raise her three daughters, um, out of the workforce for many, many, many years. Today, 
She's actually, uh, you may actually know of her because she's the mayor of Scarsdale, Jane Veron, and the founder and CEO of a major nonprofit organization. And, and, and what's so cool with all of these people and all the others, they walked me through this process. And again, they all hit the same markers and which I think I should go through so yes, that so people know what I'm talking it. about. Um, the reinvention roadmap, what people tend to go through, it's four steps, search, struggle, stop, solution. And the four steps, just to quickly walk you through. So the, the, the first step, this search was fascinating to me. This is when you're collecting information, you're collecting experiences that are ultimately going to take you to whatever your transition is. The amazing thing that I found for so many people is it's often unintentional. People are collecting this information and maybe it's a hobby or a side hustle or even a random interest. And they're not thinking of it in terms of this is how I want to change my life, but it ends up changing their life. That second step is the struggle. Okay, this is the tough one. It's when you start to disconnect from where you were before, but you haven't quite figured out where you're going. And it's miserable, the struggle. And we don't like to talk about it because it makes us feel crummy. And it's a real problem because the fact that we don't talk about it means when we tell these great stories of reinvention, it always sounds like it happens overnight. And it sounds like, you know, everybody else can go, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, college kid to tech billionaire, boom, right? And it makes us all feel bad because we feel like everyone else is on this glide path to success and only we are struggling. But everybody does it. Everybody goes through it. It's really important. And the real key here is it, during this period, this is when you feel like you're stuck. It's when you feel like you're spinning your wheels. But in fact, what I found and all of my research shows is that you're actually moving forward during that period. You just don't quite realize it consciously. But it often doesn't end until you reach that third stage, the stop. So the stop may be something that you bring on yourself, like I quit my job, but it could also be something imposed on you. For some people, it was a divorce or a kid going off to college or an illness um, or a pandemic. Uh, so it, what it is, it's something that pulls you out of your routine. And by doing so, what that does is it allows you to get perspective. And that's what allows all of these sort of disparate thoughts that are floating around and these experiences and the struggle to coalesce. And that coalesces into that moment where you realize, okay, this is where I need to go. And that leads you to that fourth and final step, which is the solution, which is where you are pivoting to. Wow. And then you, and actually what's nice is you have in the epilogue, you have brief, they're like a, a toolkit. I do. There's a dozen strategies. We can talk about a few of yeah. them, but there's a dozen strategies that I gleaned from all the people I talked to, to get you through from one stage to the next. They're very common among everybody who pivoted. Yeah. Besides doing hundreds of interviews, I mean, and, and the stories do line up into those four sections, but you also backed it up with doing a lot of um, investigation of the neuroscience of change. Yes. What did you learn from that? I learned so much. <laughs> I learned about, so there, I have a chapter on gut feeling and another chapter on aha moments, because both tend to be moments when people pivot. And um on gut feeling, one of the things that I found is the, the short answer is you can trust your gut, which I was pleased because I am a person who trusts my gut. Um, and But the reason is because it doesn't come out of nowhere. Your gut, the reason, is, there's a whole physiological reason why your gut, it's not always correct, but it generally is and, and more right than wrong. And the reason is that it actually comes from experience. It comes from, it's actually a form of pattern recognition um, that um, ne neuroscientists will tell you. It's, it's, it's the reason, it's because you've accumulated so much wisdom. And there's a business school professor who I met who uh, back at Duke, who was who did this research on top executives and how they make their decisions on what to invest in. And he found that they are inundated with data. They have more than enough data. And then they cut the data out when they're actually making the decision. Because as somebody explained to me, 
the they're, they're, they, the analogy actually that they used was a dog and a Frisbee. It's like, no matter how much data you have, it's actually not enough. And the dog and the Frisbee, if you think about it, you throw the Frisbee, the dog has their eye on the Frisbee at all times until they catch it. The dog is not doing physics or mathematical calculations. The dog is not saying, what is the humidity and what is the wind speed? The dog just like kind of knows how to do it. And, and the, the point being that no matter how much information you have, you're never gonna have complete information, but you have experience. Um, and the other analogy they use is those expert chess players. If you ever watch one of those expert chess players who can, without even thinking, like play 24 people at once. And the reason they do that, again, it's gut. It's They're not thinking consciously, but they have so much information that they've gone through so many chess games and pieces that their body is basically telling what to do. So that was gut. The, the aha moments is super cool because it literally goes according to those four steps we talked about. So in a, a, an aha moment generally happens when you are focusing, that's your search, right? You're focusing on a problem. Imagine you're trying to solve a crossword puzzle or you're focusing on a work problem and you, you're basically banging your head against the wall. And it's like, I can't take it anymore. And, um, and then you stop and then you stop. So you struggle, right? You're struggling and, it, and it's driving you crazy. Then you stop and you go for a run or you take a shower or you go to sleep and then boom, suddenly you get that aha moment. And the reason is, again, the aha moment is when you have to turn off the executive function of your brain, right? The, the part of your brain that is corralling your thoughts, it's putting up guardrails. And when you shut that down by doing anything else and not focusing, when you shut that down, it allows all of these disparate pieces that are already in your brain to coalesce, to come together. And then they emerge into your consciousness suddenly as an aha moment. Most people don't know where they come from. Um, but there was also a really cool um, um, experiment that was done with people who had aha moments. There were these researchers who interviewed people who had aha moments that led them to change their lives, like in different ways. I mean, some changed careers, some got out of toxic relationships, uh, some gave up a bad habit. And and when he probed about what, what was in common with these people was one of the things they had in common was that they were open to it. They listened to their aha moment. And I thought that was so interesting because so often when we have these sort of little light bulb moments, we are tempted to shrug them off because they seem to come from nowhere. And, uh, and it just showed you, I thought it was very, very fascinating and moving and inspiring that that the, these people said, no, I was open to it. Like that was what helped me to move on to my new career or to get out of this relationship. Wow. And, and I, you talked a lot about people who transform their lives. And, and I do want to ask what personal stories stand out in your mind. But one of the things that really struck me was the, all the trauma survivors that you talked about. And, and I was wondering if you could talk about trauma survivor and how that plays into this. Yeah, absolutely. So there, we have a chapter on post-traumatic growth. And I'm just curious, is anyone familiar with, with post-traumatic growth? It's a relatively new field. So we all know about post-traumatic stress after you've had sort of a terrible experience um, and you have flashbacks and all kinds of other symptoms. But what these um, two psychologists came up with, and this is relatively recent, they realized that in that we focus so much on the bad, but that very often what they started interviewing people who had been through terrible trauma and found that many of them had what they would call growth. They were more open to new opportunities. They took um, you know, more challenges, they strengthened their relationships, and they came up with an inventory of about 20 different ways in which people felt that they grew. The idea is not that the trauma was good in any way. That is not the point. But the point is that we focus so much on the stress and the disorder that their point is we should actually look at the ways that people can, what they call it, bounce forward, because there's no bouncing back from a terrible trauma, but the idea is to bounce forward, to make something of it. And I met, oh my God, this she, she, she may be my favorite person of all, a woman named Kay Wilson, um, who she's in Israel. I haven't actually had the, the honor of meeting her in person, but we Zoom a lot. Um, Kay was an Israeli tour guide and uh, one, and she was on their equivalent of the Appalachian Trail 
guiding a friend and one morning and these two Palestinians woke up that morning and said, we are going to kill Jews. And they set upon these two women and um, attacked them with machetes. And she, they were both left for dead and her friend did perish. Kay was about as close to death as you can be. And her, you know, hands bound, feet gown, lungs collapsed. I mean, she had 13 machete wounds um, and and they were a mile off the away because they were on a trail, a mile away from the trailhead. And she managed to get there and collapse just at the trailhead where there was a family having a little birthday party for a little boy. And she managed to survive. The amazing thing about Kay, after everything she went through, and she definitely has PTSD, but after everything she went through, she now does things. She was always an artist. She, Josh, she's shown me her paintings. They're these beautiful, happy, riotously colored paintings. She was a pianist before. She's, she plays beautiful jazz melodies. She stayed alive because she loved the, I'm getting chills. She loved this arrangement of Oscar Peterson, the jazz musician, did of Somewhere Over the Rainbow. And that, and she just, that is how she stayed alive on hiking her way back. She said, I just got to get back. And she, performed that in her head to try and keep her going. And then she started um, a foundation. This is the amazing thing the, uh, along the same lines called the Yellow Brick Road Foundation. And what it does is it is a foundation that helps the children of the people who tried to attack her, who tried to kill her. It helps Palestinian children. And she's such an amazing woman. Um, and such a great example of, of that, you know, she, she couldn't get her old life back, but in a way she bounced forward, not back, but forward. Amazing woman. Wow. Yeah. And there were, and there were several stories running through this with music playing a significant part in, uh, in this. Yeah. <laughs> well, so my first book was about music because I grew up playing music very seriously. But one of the people I interviewed, and this was so fun, I had done this a, a little while ago because he, he's not giving interviews any longer. But but Alan Greenspan, who you all know, five term former Fed chairman, I interviewed him because uh, a few people know this, but he started his career as a Juilliard trained clarinet player, jazz musician who played professionally as a jazz musician. And he told me the story about how, um, you know, during, during breaks, cause they were a union mandated jazz orchestra and they had these breaks. And during the breaks, his bandmates would go up to the green room and get high and he would stay behind and do their taxes. <laughs> <laughs> And and so and then he started reading books about like financiers and he became fascinated by money. And he said he started looking forward to his breaks more than he looked forward to the performing. And that's when he went to college. He had not been to college. He, he had to go back and go to go to school. Um, yeah, that was a great story. I love him. If someone came up to you and said, I need to reinvent my life. What advice would you give? What guidelines would you offer? Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to mention a few of the strategies. Like I said, there's a dozen strategies, very specific strategies that you can use. And I'm going to mention just a few now. And, and I hope we have time to take some questions yeah. from people too. Okay, absolutely. So um, one of the strategies that I, that I love is um, to find your expert companion. I love this so much. Expert companion is actually a phrase the, you know, the trauma psychologists I'm talking about, they invented it because that's a person who can help a trauma survivor. I think we all need an expert companion. And that is a person who has an objective view of you, who can reflect back to you, what are your strengths and what are your talents? And the reason is that we very often have these innate strengths, innate talents that are come, they come so naturally to us that we don't even recognize them and if we do recognize them, we discount them because it comes so easily, like how valuable can that be? So your expert companion can really help you focus on where your strengths and your talents are. And the other cool thing about that person is they generally don't tell you what to do, but they reflect back so that you yourself can come to your own conclusions. They're not like saying, do this. Um, but anyway, it can be a coach. And for me, it's my husband who's sitting in the front row. Um, but it could be a friend, a colleague. Um, 
and uh, it, it's very valuable. There's another one that I um, that I love, which is the idea. I just wrote about this for the New York Times, which is to invent envision your possible selves. So the idea of possible selves, it, it's a it's a psychological phrase, but basically it's a step beyond daydreaming. It's saying if I'm thinking about doing something else, I want to fully envision what is it like. What will I feel like doing that? Well, how will others perceive me doing that? It's sort of what I might do, could do, or even fear doing. And what's been found in the research is that when you envision that possible self, you, it's the first step in becoming that possible self. And that's true for careers and career change, but it's also true for mental health. There's been a bunch of research that shows that if you imagine a more positive future self, it can alleviate depression, anxiety, um, it can help people even exercise more. Um, really cool study where people were told to imagine a possible self that was a super healthy exerciser. And then another group was told to imagine a future self that was a really unhealthy couch potato. And then they came back to them weeks later and both groups were exercising more because one was possible and the other one was a feared self. So um, those work really well. Um, another one, I'm going to mention one other thing, we can mention more, but, but one other that I really love because I don't do this enough, and I'll bet none of you do this enough, which is take a break. <laughs> we tend to be, um, it, our culture is just so darn focused on, on the, um, uh, on like just power through, right? Just keep focusing power through. And in fact, all the research shows, and, and we kind of know it, but we don't do it. You know, you need to take breaks during the day. Breaks in nature are amazing. Um, I always tell people about the 90-minute rule if you're trying to focus on a problem, which is but you focus for 90 minutes, concentrated focus, and then you have to stop and take a break, and then you can come back and do another 90 minutes. You won't be able to do more than three of those a day. That's four and a half hours, and I will promise you, you will get twice as much, four times as much done as if you had sat there for 12 hours staring at your computer. It's amazing. That came out of research, by the way, from Kay Anders Erickson, who is the guy who you're probably familiar with because of the 10,000 hours, right? You know, the 10,000 hours to be an expert that Malcolm Gladwell popularized. He only took, Malcolm only took one piece of that guy's research. That, got, that guy's research were actually on violinists. And what he found that there were three things the violinists did. One was 10,000 hours. The second was they did these three 90 minute practices in a day, not more. And the third thing they did was during those 90 minutes, which is why I say no interruptions. During those 90 minutes, they did what's called deliberate practice, no interruptions, pure focus. And that was what set them apart. It wasn't just the number of hours. It was how you spent them and it was how you took your breaks. And I, I, do want to, I do want to mention one other thing, which I think is so important, because in Next, we really explode a couple of myths. And, and one is, and I referenced it briefly, this, like, this Cinderella myth, because this one drives me crazy. This idea that transformation is supposed to be overnight. You know, it's that Mark Zuckerberg or it's Vera Wang who goes from figure skater to bridal designer. But it, it's it's been... It's been beaten into us from Cinderella to Spider-Man to Superman to American Idol and who wants to be a millionaire. And, and that's why so many of us feel like we're struggling and, 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 and maybe even are tempted to give up because we think there's something wrong with us. And I just want people, if you come away with one thing tonight, that was so important to understand that it's part of the process and that you are moving forward. I love the idea of compiling your own failure CV. Oh, yeah. I just love that because I could do that. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, the, yes. So the CV of failure, this is another one. So if you're trying to figure out, like, should I stop? Because sometimes when you're trying to pivot, you actually should stop. And I asked all these experts, like, how do we know, you know? And um, this great piece of advice this scientist told me about the CV of failure, your resume of failure. And the way she described it, this is a woman who was a, a amazing scientist and she had this gold plated resume with Harvard and Berkeley and Oxford and you name it, lots of PhDs. Anyway, she was so impressive. And then she says to me, 
let me walk you through that again. And then she walks me through like every professor who told her she was a loser, every, every fellowship she didn't get, every job she was ghosted for. I mean, and she compiled it all in a CV and then she published it in Nature Magazine. And it, scientists who read Nature Magazine went absolutely crazy. It went viral because people were like, oh my God, thank God that somebody's doing this. Because you only see the successes, you don't see the failures. And we all fail. Every single person fails. And we all fail a lot. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I could have a very long CV of failure. Um, and, but, but we don't, but that's not what the world sees. And so when she did this, first of all, it just made everybody feel better. But what's really interesting about it is she found that there were two very, very valuable pieces for herself. And one was, she said, doing the CV of failure helped her understand how many things she had tried. And that alone was actually sort of gratifying to understand that. But I think perhaps even more important, her, CF, her CV of failure was data. It was really useful data because when she looked at it all in one place, she could see that her failures were all centered in the laboratory. She was a biologist. Everything was centered in things where she had to like basically use her hands to measure things, to manipulate fish. It was things that use, you know, her fingers. And um, she realized she wasn't good with that, but what it made her realize that her real strength was in what's called computational biology. And so she switched over to this much more esoteric computational biology. And now she's a rock star in that field. And, but she said it took the CV of failure for her to realize not just where she was failing, but where were her strengths. That's great. I think we do have time for questions. I am going to, if you are um, on Zoom, please type your question in chat. If you're here, <laughs> we wait for the microphone to come to you so the people on Zoom can hear the question. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for offering us this opportunity to hear you. My name is Gabriella. Um, I have a question regarding phase three, uh -huh. the stop. Do you imply that we await for the stop as a sign or because of what we're doing in terms of the research and the struggle? Or can we actually, do we actually have a hand in that stop? Is there a difference and how do we control that? Yeah, I love that question because it, it can be either or. So for some people, the stop is something that they bring on themselves. And, you know, it's, it's I quit my job. They, that's a great example, right? Um, but um, for many people who, who I spoke to, it is something that was imposed on them. It was a kid going back to school. It was an illness. It was a divorce. Like there were a lot of sort of things for the farmer who became a, um, for the economist who became a farmer, it wasn't like he exactly had a stop. He just, he had a moment. <laughs> he had a moment where he realized the farm, he was getting more and more and more into farming, which he was doing on the weekends. And he and his wife had had this conversation at the dinner table. It's like, we either have to get out of farming altogether or we have to go into it a hundred percent. So it was, it, so it can be either one. But I do think that the, the, the key is it's the moment when you can step back and get and break out of your routine. And I think all of us have this, we all have these really crazy busy lives and it's really hard to get a way to get that perspective. By the way, a stop can also be a vacation. A stop can be a sabbatical if you're lucky enough to take one. There's a great researcher named Jonathan Schooler who is a specialist in daydreaming and talks about how important daydreams are. But I said, how did you get into daydreaming research? And he said, it was actually his own stop. He said he actually was a memory researcher and he took a sabbatical. And during his sabbatical, he did a lot of daydreaming. And, <laughs> and he realized this is a far more interesting uh, area for him to pursue. And he came back and changed his, um, changed his focus and is now the world's leading expert on daydreaming. And by the way, daydreaming is good. It's, it's all okay. <laughs> I know it's just a three-part question, but there are three <laughs> elements here. So the first is, I was surprised you not did not do the audible version. So why was that? That's part A. <laughs> I love your question because I wanted to do the audible version and I was, and I, they told me it was too late. They'd already hired someone else. 
to do it. I don't know why, but I'm going to pass that on to my publisher. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, uh, secondly, were you bummed out when the James Patterson biography came out? Because your stories, you know, you've got some of the same stories. Yeah. So I was not bummed out at all because um, James Patterson, I interviewed him before his biography came out. So I felt like I had a little bit of a hand in his biography because I was getting all the stories out of him. And then, of course, he beat me to publication. But I don't think there's a huge overlap. So um, and James Patterson read the book and called it brilliant. So all is forgiven. <laughs> okay, and the last question around James Patterson, I noticed at the end of his interview, he asked, what's next for you? And I'm about a third of the way through. So I assume, is that a denouement at the end or what? <laughs> it is not a denouement at the end. I am actually, I am actually thinking about that now. And one of the things, um, I think what's next for me is changing because as I see the response to the book, um, usually I write a book and then I'm, I'm on to another topic, but this one, I can see there is a deep seated need and interest in this particular moment in time. I think we hit the zeitgeist in a moment more powerfully than I even anticipated. And so I actually am trying to think about ways to, to explore that further, because I do feel like there's this sort of white space out there where there, we are at a sort of mass moment of people reappraising how we live, how we work, how our, our organizations are structured, and um, we are not nearly at an answer yet. And I find that a really intriguing area. So more to come. I love all your questions. <laughs> Hi, my name is Michael. Um, you mentioned you were talking about uh, failure and success. This is more like a comment as how to use the two uh and it's a quote from bob dylan and he in one of his songs he says there's no success like failure but there's no but failure is no success at all and i use that as a way of looking at my life any comments yeah, I love that line. I mean, I got to love Bob Dylan. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I can't beat Bob Dylan. Um, but yes, and, and I do think that the um, there I have this chapter on failure. And one of the things actually, there are now scientists who study failure. And one of the things they talk about is how to fail successfully, which I also found to be really important. I don't know how much it goes to Bob Dylan's point, but um, what I found with, with failure, how to be a successful failure is this is another thing that, that is sort of culturally, we tend to get frustrated and give up on things. Whereas what the scientists will tell you is that generally we fail because we stop too soon. Um, and the, the analogy that this data science at Northwestern used with me was the melting ice cube. And so your job, let's say, is to melt an ice cube and you walk into the room and there's an ice cube and it's 21 degrees in the room. So you go up a degree and it still doesn't melt and you go up another degree and it doesn't melt and you go and you go and you go and you finally you reach 31 degrees and you're like, forget it, it will never melt and you give up, <laughs> right? And he said, too often, that's where we are. So his, his um, advice and what he has found works. He's studied a lot of like athletes and other people who have been extremely successful after failing. And what he says is you need to do two things. And one is to fail fast, not in the technology dangerous way, but to fail and then tweak. Instead of fail and give it up, you fail and tweak, you fail and tweak, you fail and tweak um, per the ice cube. Um, and then the other thing that uh, that he said um about failure is what was the other thing now i forgot the other thing now i've i've just lost it but anyway fail fast and tweak yeah i'm just uh curious about your process in writing speaking of uh failure you hear people say what a struggle it is to write a book and so i'm just curious you know after write reading about Robert Caro and, you know, how he would spend years and do all these, long, everything by longhand. What's your process in terms of interviewing? Do you try to put the information down right away? And, you know, how do you do in terms of doing a book? Obviously, you're a reporter, so you're 
used to doing it in shorter form, but I was just curious about how you approach the book because that seems like such a arduous, you know, challenge. Yeah, yeah. So this is my third book and they are really, 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 really hard and you do struggle. It's hard to write a book. Um, but I love the process. So um, I don't know, that doesn't sound right. I sound very masochistic and I guess I am. Um, but I love the process of writing. Writing for me, it is like giving birth to every word. It is difficult, but I love polishing once it's on the paper. Um, on, on the page. Uh, but for the reporting, it's, the book is really all about the reporting. And, and the reporting for me was really interesting because I went in with a very open mind with this particular book. I just, I wanted to know, like, how do we change successfully? And I was all over asking different kinds of people. So I did a ton of research just to look for people who had gone through tremendous transitions. And you know, that was everything from my own research to, you know, a lot of um, going back into the archives of things that I'd reported on in the past to putting out uh, on social media to asking friends there. I'm going to embarrass Elise Clayman and who's in the audience here, who is the one who said you should meet Jane Barron, the mayor of Scarsdale, uh, who is an amazing person. And and she was exactly right. Um, so the people came from all over. I love doing the interviews. James Patterson was obviously someone who I'd known. Uh, and then I started researching the kinds of change. And then that was really a matter of tracking down the scientists um, and finding the people going back and back and back to find the originators, like who originated post-traumatic growth, you know, who was the originator of possible selves and tracking down those scientists and um, and interviewing them multiple times. And then what I did, and the real, the key, actually the breakthrough for me is because I had a mass of information and so much, I was sort of drowning in information. And the key for me was at one point, I just started um, do, I, on paper, pen and paper, I started sketching out the process that different people told me they went through. And that was when I had my next aha moment, when I looked at this process and I realized that different words, same stages that they were describing. And that to me was, that was actually, that's where everything coalesced and I was able to kind of put together the book. But it, it, it's a difficult process and there's a ton of research, but the research part for me is a lot of fun. Hi, uh, Jan. I'm Chris Bishop. Um, fascinating. I haven't read your book yet. I'm looking forward to buying it and reading it. Can you share some anecdotes about your own reinvention? I mean, from Wall Street Journal reporter to big jobs in media to Yale professor. I mean, that's quite a quite an arc, quite a you know story. Yeah, yeah. So well, first of all, I, I love this question because it reminds me that so many of the people who I interviewed had what I thought of were really extreme pivots. And I would say to them, wow, how did you go from cattle farmer, you know, from, from economist to cattle farmer or this other woman who was like the budget fashionista and now she's an investor in black owned technology companies, but she used to be an epidemiologist. And I would say to these people, <laughs> I'd say to these people, how do you get from there to here? I don't see the connection. And every person would look at me like I was nuts. They're like, I didn't reinvent anything. It was like, it's a fuller expression of who I am. And this was, by the way, something that was common to everyone I spoke to. And I think this is a key to why people I spoke to successfully were able to reinvent is because they didn't just drop an identity and adopt a new one. They saw it was all organic. It was one thing led to the next, to the next. And even though to the outside world, it all looked different to them, it all had, it was all part of a piece. And I would, I would answer the same thing for myself. I mean, my self-identity, and we talk a lot about self-identity in the book is journalist. Like that's who I am. And um, so going from the Wall Street Journal um, you know, I started as a reporter. That's all I ever wanted to be. I got dragged in by my boss into editing, kicking and screaming. I was like, I don't want to edit. I just want to write. And then I started editing and it turned out I loved editing because it was all the, for me, the easy parts of writing, which is coming up with the ideas and then polishing it at the end. Um, and, uh, and then the editing then led to, 
starting a new magazine. Well, you know, at the Wall Street Journal, I got these wonderful opportunities. I created Weekend Journal, I created Personal Journal, and the Saturday paper. We didn't used to have a Saturday paper. And um, I was given all these opportunities to innovate within the organization. So I was able to constantly reinvent myself within the same organization. So I feel like every other move that I have made is similar, it's just in different organizations. So then I went to Condé Nast and created a magazine. And then I went to USA Today and, and Gannett, where I was chief content officer, and I had to create something new. They had 110 newspapers and they wanted to bring it together into the USA Today network. So that again, that was another sort of reinvention within, a, within an organization. And now teaching, I'm teaching journalism. I'm teaching the media and democracy. So that doesn't feel like that much of a of a stretch. And, and, you know, the other mediums like television and podcasts and all those other mediums are all, and books are all sort of part of the same. So for me, again, just like the people I interviewed for the book, it is all organic. Looking out, are there any other questions? Well, good, because that'll give us time to sell some books. <laughs> Elm Street Books is right over there. They're our good partner. Um, and I cannot thank you enough. Um, I did I did want to ask about Plato. Oh, yeah, I, you, I can. If, do you guys want to hear about Plato? Yeah, I yeah. think it's, it's a story <laughs> worth hearing. <gasps> okay, so, so just briefly. So I have a chapter, a couple of chapters that actually look at not just how do you, we as individuals can change, but how organizations can change. And Plato is one of my favorites because it brings into play sort of everything. Um, and and what, you know, one, there's one other element which we haven't hit on that much, which is so many of the people who I interviewed ended up somewhere else. And this is another myth that we explode in next, which is this idea from those books like Think and Grow Rich and all of those books that tell us you have to have a goal and then you have to work backwards and you have to have every step on the way toward to make that goal. And what I found with so many of the people I interviewed is they actually ended up in places totally unexpected. They never expected they were going to end up there. And that was the case with Plato, which you may not know. Um, Plato was invented more than 100 years ago, but it had a different name. It was called Kutal Wallpaper Dough, and it was a household cleaner. Plato was invented to clean the coal soot off of your wallpaper. And uh, that was back in the 20s and the 30s. And by the 50s, uh, it was a family owned company. And um, by the 50s, it was dying because, you know, we didn't have coal stoves anymore. And it was on its last legs. And the, it was it, everybody in the family made their living off of Kutal. And it was it was a real crisis moment. Talk about a stop moment. And they, the, the, the owner, the family member who owned it, he was going to mortgage his house. They were looking at bankruptcy, like they were on their last legs. And uh, and then he got a call from his sister-in-law, who I call his expert companion, because his sister-in-law was a nursery school teacher in New Jersey. And she said, hey, do you know you can use your Kutal wallpaper dough and make little clay animals out of it? And then you bake them in the oven and voila, you, it's modeling clay. And... <laughs> He, the, she did it, the, the woman and her husband, by the way, her husband, uh, Dr. Zufall, that she was, they were the Zufalls. Um, Dr. Zufall is still with us. He's 96. I had several lengthy interviews with him. He is so amazing. And I know this story because of 96 year old Dr. Zufall told it to me. Um, but what happened was he and his wife um, figured out this modeling clay the brother-in-law flew out from Cincinnati to check it out. He's like, my God, this is amazing. They worked with a chemist to take out the soap part and they put in that chemist that they hired, put in the aroma that we know so well right now. And he also, the owner of the company, he came up with the name, which was Rainbow Modeling Clay. And Dr. Zufall called him up and said, that is a terrible name. <laughs> and Dr. Zufall came up with the name Plato. So <laughs> I just love that story. <laughs> and the rest is history. He's, Dr. Zufall, who he said to me, I've written a lot of words in my life, but only two of them became famous. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so thank you very much. Thank, um, you. thank you. Thank you guys for having me.